the last time I was here was wonderful. I so many good questions, and this is exactly where I want to be, because if it's uh, if I'm not here, then Bill Gates will be here, and he's got a different message. Uh, you know, this this is very hotly contested um, territory, teacher education programs, right? The billionaires in the world have a vision for, uh, well, basically eliminating you all and putting computers in your place. <laughs> but if they can't do that, at least uh, convince you to just prepare them for the next test. And so this is exactly where I want to be um, sharing lessons with you from my experience as a teacher, uh, from my tours around the country on the book, meeting with parents, students, and teachers who are defending their communities, and, um, and my experience you know, editing Rethinking Schools magazine to try to help you guys resist this corporate education reform onslaught. And so I really want to thank Cynthia for bringing me out. It's the last time I didn't get to meet you, so it's wonderful to be able to come back and deepen the conversation uh, that we started last time, right on. And uh, deepen the conversation, meet Cynthia, add on. You know, last time I told you the story of the map test boycott, and that's always a lot of fun <laughs> to explain how an entire school and then uh, a network of schools across the city revolted and helped to spark what they called the education spring where schools just refused, right? That first spring in 2013 really ignited this national movement. You know, Garfield refusing and then students walking out in Portland and Chicago and all over the country. And then the opt-out movement of parents exploding that spring. And uh, we, we got into some depth there. And it, it, was, uh, it was great. And I hope today we can build on that conversation about how we've become the largest uprising against high stakes testing in US history. And yes, absolutely. And specifically, uh, the impact that these tests have on students of color I want to address today uh, in, more, in more depth. But what's, what's really great to see is we've gone from a situation where it's just us and our children who are being intimidated to actually intimidating those in power, right? We've gone from a situation where you, you uh, did people see John Oliver's show on, on testing? He said, you know you got a problem when there's actual protocol for what to do when a child throws up on the test, <laughs> right? You know that, that the test prep stress is over the top when there's protocol for that, right? Um, so we've gone from a situation where it's just us who are stressed and under attack to actually the corporate education reformers or the testocracy, as I call them, they're the ones sweating a little bit for a change. You can see it in the way their rhetoric has shifted this year. I want to look at that a little bit because we left no child left behind, behind, <laughs> right? And the new uh, federal education legislation the ESSA, my good friend Wayne Al calls it, everything stays the same act. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's not quite that. It's not quite that. Um, because actually, some of the rhetoric changed because of the size and scope of this mass revolt against testing. So one of the most obnoxious and idiotic uh, provisions of No Child Left Behind was this annual yearly progress. And so they said all schools will be proficient in math and reading by 2014, a statistical, uh, not just improbability, but impossibility that no country anywhere in the world has achieved. And then the tests are designed so that you cannot achieve it. <laughs> but we put that goal forward so that we can label your schools failing, so that when they fail, we can cut the money so that we can close them down, so that then we can privatize them and turn them into charters. You all know about this problem here. You have one of the wealthiest people the world has ever known, Eli Broad, getting ready to try to turn half the schools in, in LA into charters so that you can have public funds go under the control of private 
entities, right? That is the neoliberal free market dream. Uh, and so that provision of the annual yearly progress, that if you weren't making progress towards this goal of 100%, then your school would be labeled failing, and you'd be put on a performance plan, and if you didn't meet it, then your school is shut down. That horrible piece of legislation was struck down in the new ESSA, and I think that is a testament to the size of this movement that, that's grown. Uh, unfortunately, they've kept a lot of the worst provisions in terms of they, they maintain this uh, annual testing requirement, starting with third graders, right? Um, and so much of, this, much of the same testing is in place, uh, which is really unfortunate, and it just means that we all have a lot more to fight for. Um, but the other way you know that they're a little bit on the run, that their ideas have been proven to be false, and that their policies of test and punish aren't working, they haven't improved schools, and now they're in trouble as this movement explodes across the country. 200,000 parents in New York State opting out, 60,000 parents in my home state of Washington opting out the last year, mass walkouts across the country of students, more and more teachers refusing to administer these tests, uh, has forced them to change their rhetoric and now there's a new line of attack on the opt-out movement that you all should be ready to take up and defend. Um, it started with a comment that Arne Duncan said before uh, he left his post as Secretary of Education and he put it like this quotes, um, white suburban moms who all of a sudden their child isn't as brilliant as they thought they were and their school isn't quite as good as they thought they were, they're the ones making up this opt-out movement. They're the ones opposing Common Core. It's white suburban moms and now that argument has uh, increasingly uh, reached the media and communities across the country as best characterized by a man named Charles F. Coleman Jr., an attorney, a black attorney in New York State. And he just wrote an article in the Huffington Post uh, where he attacks the opt-out movement uh, saying that opting out is for privileged white people and it's gonna hurt black children. My goal today is to make sure you leave this room knowing how insane uh, an idea that is. Okay? Absolutely. Charles F. Coleman, Jr. You should read his piece on the Huffington Post, and then you should read my rebuttal that's going to be printed in uh, The Progressive tomorrow. Okay? Um, so let me read to you what he says, uh, a couple paragraphs of his argument, um, why, op why um, standardized testing is good for black children and why um, you should not opt out. So here's what he writes, quote, boycotting standardized tests may seem like a good idea, but hurts black learners the most. To put it plainly, white parents from well-funded and highly performing areas are, particip are participating in, in petulant, poorly conceived protests that are ultimately affecting inner city blacks at schools that need the funding and the measures of accountability to ensure any hope of progress in performance. Groups of parent activists have been popping up across the country expressing their disapproval over standardized testing. While there should be uh, concerns raised over excessive testing and, devotion, and devoting too much classroom instruction to test prep, the long-term effects of opting out could be even worse, particularly for communities of color, even more troublesome, the immediate effects of losing federal funding has a real impact on schools least able to take the hit. Standardized testing, albeit imperfect, yep, uh, remains one of the best ways to ensure that teachers, schools, and school districts are held accountable for making sure children are succeeding. So I'm going to take up seven points tonight uh, to tell you um, why that isn't true. Number one, I want to show you how the tests are constructed. I want to take a look at why inequality, um, especially around 
uh, class and race is built into the very logic of how a standardized test is constructed for the first point. So let's take a look at this diagram. Do I need the microphone to take with me or? Okay. So let's look at what a standardized test is. This is normal distribution. If the standardized test does not produce this, then that standardized test is deemed to be invalid, right? So that what does this test show? This test uh, given to a population of students shows a few students fail, most of the students are in the middle, and they do average, and then the students at the top, whoop, the students at the top, uh, a few do really well, right? Now what would happen if this changed? What would happen if all of a sudden a lot of students were doing well? What if everybody passed the test? If everybody passed the test, that test would be called invalid. That's clearly not a good measure of student learning. They would, it was either too easy, something was wrong with it. So the test mandates failure. It ha you have to have people failing. If you don't, it's not a valid measure. In my mind, any exam, any measure that mandates failure is invalid in itself. So this is how it works, um, right? Smaller number of students get low scores. This is the normal distribution. Now let's take a look. Oh, there's the ceiling. What happened if you got this curve? Um, now let's take a look at this. This is the next problem. You see this jumping line? This is a brilliant essay by Jersey Jazzman, by the way, that you should go to his website and take a look. That jumping line is called a cut score. You guys know what a cut score is? A cut score is the score that is de de determines whether you fail, whether you pass or fail. So where do you want to put that cut score? How, do you guys know how they determine where that score goes? Uh, nobody in this room will ever be part of that discussion. Nobody who's ever had experience teaching will be part of that discussion. Where you set that line is a political decision made by politicians and then the testing agency. So in Washington state recently, the, uh, the state uh, politicians along with the Smarter Balance Consortium, the Smarter Balance produces one of the tests connected to Common Core, they got into a room and a few hours later they left the room and they'd set the, <laughs> they set the cut score where they wanted it. So now anybody who's below it fails. The new cut scores they're setting on purpose to fail larger numbers of kids so that they can show the test has rigor. Right? It's not based on what educators believe is best practice. It's just based on a politicians' rhetoric around rigor. This is the last slide I want to show you about standardized testing bell curves. What does that bell curve tell you about that student? Does it tell you their aptitude? Does it tell you their skills? Does it tell you what they learned that year? The number one, the, the number one thing that test tells you is their access to resources and their proximity to the dominant culture. Right? That's what researchers in university after university after study after study after study show that the people at this end of the bell curve have less money. And the people up here have the most amount of money. Right? It, uh, in fact, most of the research shows that where you end up on this bell curve, uh, m over 50% of it has to do with out-of-school factors. Right? Um, so, the first problem that we're dealing with is these tests are not scientific measures, right? Uh, they measure uh, your access to resources and um, how close you are to, uh, in our society, a white middle class uh, dominant uh, perspective. So, 
I don't believe that that's a valid way to judge any student, uh, and especially not our students of color who disproportionately fall into the, the low socioeconomic status, right? So that's point one. Point two, uh, Coleman says in his essay, quote, there should be concerns raised over excessive testing and devoting too much classroom uh, instruction to test prep, but doesn't acknowledge how destructive excessive testing has become, right? So he's, he says, yeah, we should think about that. And then he doesn't really explain what we mean by excessive testing. Do people know how many tests are administered? You're going to have to go out into the classroom soon and administer these tests. What's the, the average public school student? How many of these tests will they take in their pre-K now to high school career? The latest study shows the average high school student will take 112 standardized tests in their career as a student. 112, and that's the average student. But if you are a student in a low-income neighborhood, if you're a student in high poverty, if you're a student of color or a black student, that number of standardized tests just climbs, right? As they're reducing the intellectual and emotional process of teaching and learning to a single score. Right? And especially in, in our communities of color. And I've, I've put it like this. The, the kind of thinking that would lead you to believe that giving one more standardized test is going to improve education for anybody is the kind of thinking that would lead you to believe that if you see a child shaking uncontrollably, clearly suffering from hypothermia, then you go and take their temperature and then take it again and again and again and again and again and 112 times, and then you decide what to do, right? We believe that if you see a child shaking uncontrollably, clearly suffering from hypothermia, you go and wrap that child in a blanket and you give them the wraparound services they need, the healthcare programs, the tutoring services, the smaller class sizes, the arts programs that you would need to nurture uh, that student and provide them the resources they need for a robust uh, education, right? Um, and so that's uh, specifically the impact that's happening in, in our communities of color. Um, the tests are driving out the arts. In, in Seattle, they did a study that there were over 25 schools that had less than 20 minutes of recess in the elementary schools, right? So which schools were those? It wasn't random. It was the schools serving kids of color. So those kids don't get to play or any of the benefits that actually all the research says young kids learn the most from free play, right? The, emotion, the social and emotional development, the problem solving that happens on the playground you just can't get in any other way. Uh, and though, but those students, <laughs> they don't get that. Uh, point three. Point three is, uh, Coleman writes this, quote, white parents from well-funded and highly performing areas are participating in poorly conceived protests. Okay? So he portrays this as a white movement uh, to opt out. Well, it's true there are a lot of white middle class moms who are opting their kids out. In New York State, where they have the 200,000, some of the largest concentrations are in Long Island, where there is a lot of white middle class moms. But to call this a white movement is really to erase the communities of color, to make us invisible, this growing rebellion that's happening around the country and that's growing in communities of color. It's to make invisible the leadership of this movement that is actually disproportionately people of color who are leading this movement, right? So we can look at people like Karen Lewis, the black woman who's leading the Chicago Teachers Union, who's done more in this fight than perhaps anybody. And she led the Let Us Teach campaign uh, of the teachers fighting against these tests 
And in Chicago last year, black parents opted their kids out at a rate of 10%, right? Um, a really impressive, incredible uh, figure. This movement really, what, you know, I talked about the map test boycott being one of the main sparks of this movement uh, last time. And, you know, Garfield, where I teach, is the school in the historically black neighborhood in Seattle, um, where we have some 60% students of color, um, and the Black Student Union supported it, uh, and the NAACP in Seattle came out this past uh, last spring, and the president of the Seattle NAACP held a press conference where he said, quote, the opt-out movement is a vital component of the Black Lives Matter movement and other struggles for social justice in our region. Using standardized tests to label black people and immigrants as lesser while systematically underfunding their schools has a long and ugly history in this country and he called on all parents to opt out of the test. Um, you can take another detonator of this opt-out movement happened in New York at Castle Bridge Elementary. There's an amazing chapter here um, by Dow who writes, she's one of the PTA co-chairs, and she writes about how she organized what became over 90% of parents opting their, their elementary school students out of the test at a school that serves over 70% students of color. And because so many families opted out, they had to cancel the test altogether, and the students got their class time back with their teacher to learn uh, rather than be taken away. And that became a national news stories, and PTAs around the country uh, took that up. We can look at one of the largest walkouts in US history against high stakes standardized tests. Where was it, and what happened? Um, let me just show you the video. Um, I can't say for sure if uh, this network news channel is going to portray these students well, but um, this happened in New Mexico last year against the new Common Core test. These schools uh, this is one of the largest walkouts ever in U.S. history against high-stakes testing, and these schools serve 90% um, or more Latino students. Let's take a look. That's going to be used to evaluate students and teachers. Tonight, we took their concerns <laughs> to the state's that. education secretary. The do serve Dean Jose Mitri is live at a Crystal Heritage Academy High School with what she had to say. Jose? Just the students walking out of class here were met by students from two other high schools for one of the biggest protests of the day. But the education secretary tells me these students missed out on a good opportunity. <laughs> students at the Crisco Heritage Academy High School, South Valley Academy, and Rio Grande High School protested here, while others <laughs> from all over Albuquerque Even Rio Rancho and Las Cruces walked out on the park exam. It's the new standardized test for third through 11th graders that will be used to evaluate students and their teachers. What's happening now is that teachers are afraid that their evaluation is going to be so low that they need to start teaching directly to the test. And what that's going to do is that's going to lead kids to stop wanting to come to school because of a dull curriculum. The most thing that we're scared about losing is like losing the fluidity in our classrooms and losing that teacher student relationship that we have that teaches to all learning styles and not just the one that is catered to by this test. We took their concerns to the education secretary. More than a thousand students walked out in schools from Albuquerque to Las Cruces. What are you thinking when you see this? What we saw today was about 48,000 students successfully started <laughs> taking their assessment. So when I put this in. All right, I will cut her off. I can't really. <clears throat> Right, don't listen to what the students want. We're just an education system. <laughs> um, but you saw that? Like, the streams of students uh, who organized around this. So to call this a white movement, to me, is to erase those Latino students uh, who are leading this. And finally, if you haven't yet listened to the brilliant podcast called These Tests Will Go, The Opt-Out Movement in Urban Philadelphia, 
please go take a listen to that. It's interviews with black parents in Philadelphia about why they have built the opt-out movement and why they think this spring it's going to be larger than ever. Um, and I, by the way, I'm going to uh, Albuquerque for the first time in a couple uh, in April, and I can't wait to meet my heroes who led this movement. I get to speak at one of those high schools that had the biggest walkouts. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, point four. The federal government um, and punishing the schools. So Coleman writes, the immediate effect of losing federal funds has a real impact on schools least able to take the hit. So his point is this. If the opt-out rate means that students, uh, that the, the number of students taking the test falls below 95%, then there's a provision that's been carried over from No Child Left Behind into the new ESSA that says they can then sanction school districts, um, possibly with funds, uh, cutting funds if uh, the number of kids taking the test drops, right? And on the face of it, that sounds pretty scary. And um, you could see his point. We wouldn't want to have funds cut from any schools, especially schools serving low-income students or black students, students of color. Um, but there's one catch. First off, it has never happened in the history of the United States that any school has lost money because the opt-out rate uh, went um, so high that it dropped below 95%. So in New York, um, last, last spring, there were dozens, upon, dozens of school districts that had less than 95% and not a single one was reprimanded or sanctioned in any way because they know that if they come and cut funds from your school because you wanted to do what was best for your child, that's going to make the opt-out movement that much more angry, that much more visible, and that much more uh, right when we say this is a test and punish system that has no place in our school system, right? So they have actually never used that clause. And, you know, sometimes you do have to risk in this struggle for social justice. But I think the larger point is this. We actually believe that the opt-out movement holds the promise for getting the tens of millions of dollars we need from the testing companies to be used for our schools. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, Pearson alone, right? The Pearson Testing Corporation is a $9 billion a year annual uh, corporation. And they do the park test, they consult on Smarter Balance. What if we took that $9 billion and invested it into tutors, right? Invested it into arts programs and smaller class sizes, right? It's the opt-out movement that's raising that possibility. And we will never get there if we don't build an opt-out movement uh, large enough to uh, wrest the money away from the testocracy and bring it back to the classroom. Um, so that's the struggle I think we have to be in. And we have to be in that struggle because of point five, that there are real stakes attached to these tests. There are ways they use these tests to punish our kids. Um, they've never punished a school for having high uh, a school district for having too many opt-outs, but they have punished schools for taking the test, right? That's what they do in, in places like Chicago when they close 49 schools with the stroke of a pen, right? Because they labeled these schools failing, and then they close them down, and then they reopen some as charters so they can get public funds into private hands, okay? Um, which schools did they close in Chicago? Was it random, <laughs> right? It was 87% schools that were majority black, right? So they, if you take these tests, that's when you're likely to be punished. <laughs> we want to opt out and pro provide a much bigger uh, vision. And I'll say that I think one of the ways that the test and punish regime is the most despicable is 
the way in which it fuels the school to prison pipeline. And us educators have seen this for a long time, but a study came out recently from a man named Kevin Lang in Boston University who found that the number one outcome of high stakes exit exams required for high school graduation is increased incarceration rates, right? And I haven't seen a single person in the corporate education reform movement, I haven't heard from any of these testocrats answer to that. What's your response to that? If these exit exams are creating this mass incarceration system, are, are contributing to it, then uh, they have to go. And we know that uh, in, a, th in this country we have more black people behind bars than were slaves on plantations in 1850. We have an absolute uh, catastrophe uh, in, in black neighborhoods, in, in, in um, black communities, and the school to prison pipeline is a big part of that, and the high stakes tests are contributing to it, and they gotta go. Uh, point six, standardized testing and its origins, right? I think that when Coleman says boycotting standardized tests may seem like a good idea but hurts black learners the most, you really will never believe that once you know the origins. And I, I spoke a little bit about the origins. Do people remember who invented the first standardized test that entered the schools? What was it? Yeah, well that was, um, Absolutely, some of the first IQ tests that were really supposed to, they were really supposed to be about checking for some uh, learning disabilities in, some, in a limited uh, scope. But then when they came to the US, it was completely transformed. And actually, in the hands of eugenicists, these tests became tools for uh, the arguments for white supremacy. Not just white supremacy, they argued that these tests could be shown, uh, would, would demonstrate that the northern Europeans were much smarter than the swarthy southern Europeans, right? That, that these tests would, would demonstrate that men were smarter than women, that native born were smarter than immigrant, uh, and certainly that, that white were smarter than black. That was the point of these tests. Um, a man named Carl Brigham, uh, was one of the leading eugenicists. He uh, conducted over a million uh, standardized tests to the military during World War I. And then after World War I, he took a post at Princeton University and he adapted those tests into uh, the tests. I hope you didn't have to take it to get in here, but uh, you may have the SAT, right? So the SAT test is invented by a man who wrote this book called A Study in American Intelligence, one of the white supremacist manifestos of uh, the time. I want to read to you the last page of A Study in American Intelligence so you can hear from the man who invented the SAT. <laughs> he says, quote, according to all evidence then, American intelligence is declining. It sounds like the, the scare, what we hear today we're falling behind the rest of the world, okay? He says, um, and it will proceed with an accelerating rate as the racial admixture becomes more and more extensive. The decline of American intelligence will be more rapid than the decline of intelligence uh, of European national groups owing to the presence here of the Negro, right? <laughs> it's very clear. Uh, what, what the, uh, and then if you look at these tests, it's just absurd, right? What are the tests? The test questions are about an emerald is. Well, who has emeralds, right? Uh, and then it's like A, B, C, D uh, questions. And, and that's, uh, right. So, it sh so then by 1920, uh, um, about 2 million school children were now being tested with these kind of exams 
um, mostly for the purposes of tracking in the public schools to put to find to put white kids on the higher track and then uh, wealthy white kids on the highest track and to put immigrants and, and African Americans on the low track right and the stability of the test scores from then till today should be all you need to know that these tests really haven't changed and that the underfunding of black and brown communities really hasn't changed uh, at all. And it shouldn't surprise you then if white supremacists were the first people to demand that these tests be used in the public schools, that the first people to organize and fight against these standardized tests were black intellectuals. Who do I mean? Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. The founder, one of the founding members of the NAACP, one of the most important black radicals, intellectual thinkers in, in uh, U.S. history, also was one of uh, the most adamant opponents of these tests. Um, Horace Mann Bond, who was the father of Julian Bond, who was a recent NAACP president, um, he was a scholar, and he wrote this about the standardized tests. He said, quote, but so long as any group of men attempts to use these tests as funds of information for the approximation of crude and inaccurate generalizations, so long we must continue to cry hold or stop. To compare the crowded millions of New York's east side with the children of Morningside Heights, an upper class uh, neighborhood at the time, indeed involves a great contradiction, and to claim that the results of these tests given to such diverse groups drawn from such varying strata of the social complex are in any way accurate is to expose the fictitious sense uh, of unfairness and lack of appreciation of the great environmental factors of urban life. He said it's the environmental factors that are leading to black students scoring lower on these tests. It's the same thing I just showed you uh, with the bell curves, the zip code effect, that what these tests are measuring is your access to resources. He made that argument back in the 1940s. Can we please learn that today, right? We're still struggling to hear that, that basic message. Uh, point seven, Coleman asserts in his essay, Standardized testing, albeit an imperfect form, remains the best way to ensure that teachers, schools, and school districts are held accountable to make sure black children are, are succeeding. And I think here he makes uh, his most important point, and the rest of it is really out of touch. The rest of it is really, really uh, uninformed. This one we need to take more seriously. Because I do think that we need to have a school system that is more accountable to black and brown students. Uh, the question, though, is how we get there. And what type of accountability do we need? And who do we need to hold accountable? That there's definitely a problem. And I even sympathize with black and brown parents who sometimes have uh, a situation of a, a teacher who's not culturally competent and doesn't understand their student and the black parent or the brown parent says you know what even if that teacher doesn't respect you or know where you're coming from you can score high on the test and show you're smart and I understand that that uh, impetus and that that emotion and in some parents are able to get the kid the test prep they need to be able to, to show that or some, some kids don't have to uh, work around the clock or take care of younger siblings and have time to study and, and do prove the system wrong, right? But there's an important body of evidence that shows that there are much better forms of accountability in uh, the schools that will actually be able to hold our school system uh, accountable for educating our black and brown students with a meaningful empowering education and I want to talk uh, a little bit about the New York consortium schools for performance-based assessment if I talked a little bit about them before since the last time we met a documentary was released called Beyond Measure 
And this film shows the relationship that we teachers at Garfield High School built with the New York Consortium Schools. We've been flying there for several years to learn from these fully public schools, fully public schools. They're not charter schools. They don't get any extra money. In fact, they have higher rates of uh, special needs students than the general uh, population in New York City. Um, the only difference with these schools and the rest of the New York public schools is that they have a waiver and they don't have to give the standardized test. So, by the measures of the corporate reformers, they should be the very worst schools, right? How could they be, how could they be serving kids of color? How could they be serving any kids if they don't have the accountability measures you would need to have high expectations and good outcomes and close the achievement gaps, as, as the corporate reformers put it. Um, the problem for the testocracy is that these are the very best schools in New York City. How can I claim that? What evidence is there? I would urge you to go online and look at the new study that they released about the outcomes for their students, which are absolutely breathtaking. They have 77% of their English language learners graduating in four years, which is by far, far and away higher than the rest of the New York City public schools. Uh, they have 82% uh, graduation of uh, their schools in four years um, compared with 73% citywide. So higher graduation rates. 86% of their black students were accepted into college compared to 37% of black students nationally, right? <laughs> I mean, the outcomes are off the charts better. How do they do this? Well, they have an inquiry-based approach in the classroom that empowers students to pursue the things that are important to them, not the scripted curriculum that's imposed from outside. And then they have a performance-based assessment system that works much like a PhD candidate, right? At the PhD level, they want you to be able to think. They don't want to know, are you good at eliminating wrong answer choices? Are you good at guessing like the test maker? I mean, that's the only way I got into college was I was fortunate my mom could afford the test prep class. And I had to take it again and again. My, I was a terrible test taker and I had to take the, the class twice and then I had to take the SAT several times. But I figured out how to eliminate wrong answer choices well enough to get a score I needed to get to college. Is that real learning? Right? Is that a skill you'll ever use again in the rest of your life? Right? Oh, those people who know how to eliminate wrong answer choices, we really want them uh, running society. No, the performance consortium, you develop a thesis. Something that you care, some problem you've been working on in the class that relates to something in your life that you find important. And then you develop an argument. And then you might be wrong, your argument might be wrong. So you have to do research over time and if the evidence doesn't match your argument, you revise your thesis. And then you work with your peers and a mentor and at the end of the semester or the end of the year, you defend your dissertation, right, as it were. You defend your thesis um, to a panel of experts. So you might have your principal, you might have peers who are uh, working in similar uh, thesis statements, and then you bring in outside experts from New York City, right? People who, if you're in a language arts class, bring in an author, right? If you're in an art class, bring in an uh, uh, artist from New York City to comment on your art. And then it's not time away from the classroom, it's actually uh, time continuing to study. And it's that model that's producing uh, incredible outcomes for, for our kids. Um, but I, I'll just, I, uh, I just want to say that when I had a chance to debate um, the, one of the former assistant secretaries of education, uh, Peter Cunningham, 
I, I debated him on um, Al Jazeera recently. Uh, and after I uh, appeared in that debate, someone from his website wrote an article that said, more than a score, duh. And the article said, um, you know, people who say children are more than a score, of course they're more than a score. We're not saying that they're not more than a score. But we just need accountability and we just need measures. Um, and then the, the example this, this uh, person used was, like, you wouldn't have kids do a swimming test. Uh, you wouldn't just throw kids into the deep end without first doing a swimming test. And you wouldn't have kids go drive a car without first taking a driver's test. So obviously we need forms of accountability and testing to find where people are. Yes, we do. Those are exactly the type of tests we need. We need performance-based assessments. We need to know if you can swim. We're, you're going to sit the kid down with a pencil and paper on swimming. What are the different swimming strokes? Let me bubble in A, B, C, or D. And then we're going to throw them into the deep end? That would be ludicrous, right? So we need performance-based assessments. The article was so ridiculous, I didn't write a rebuttal, but the more I think about it, I, I want to pick this, I want to show them exactly, uh, because teachers aren't against tests. We invented tests, but we need forms of assessment that actually uh, are empowering to our students. And then we need to talk about true accountability. And as uh, the great professor Pedro Nogueira said, We've designed an accountability system in this country that holds those with the most power the least accountable. Where's the accountability for the bankers who sabotage the global economy, la laid waste to our school system from uh, the, the fallout, right? And then they walked away with golden parachutes, right? And not one of them is behind bars, right? So we have a great struggle to undertake, to fight for accountability, um, to opt out of these tests, and to opt into uh, a real structure of accountability that could empower our students, opt into ethnic studies programs that could teach black kids about their culture and the history uh, uh, of their people and the struggles they've been through, to opt into restorative justice programs to end zero tolerance uh, that's pushing black kids out of school at higher rates, right? To opt into uh, counseling services that can help kids who are going through the trauma of being homeless or the trauma of dealing uh, with police abuse and profiling, right? We need to develop healthcare systems in our school that can uh, nurture our students. And that's what real accountability to me would look like. And, and that's uh, the struggle for the public school system that I, I'm in. And I hope uh, to see you all, I know you're already part of this movement, and I hope to see you in the classrooms taking it to the next step. So thank you all for your time tonight.